Alrighty then, let's go ahead and get going. Hello everyone, happy lab week. Um, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are in the country. I know that this is the day that you've been waiting for. It's the most exciting day when you get to hear about microbiology today and tomorrow. Um, so I'm gonna start it off with bacteriology. Uh, my name is Yvette McCarter. Um, I direct the microbiology laboratory at UF Health Jacksonville in Jacksonville, Florida. And I was also previously in a former life, uh, an associate program director for our residency program as well. So let's get going. And let's start, see if I can get it going, with question number one. Uh, which of the following is the optimal specimen for the diagnosis of infective endocarditis? Is it a single 50 ml central venous sample for culture? Is it a paired peripheral blood culture drawn from the same site? Three peripheral blood cultures drawn every 24 hours? And, or three peripheral blood cultures collected over a 24 hour period. Um, and the answer is gonna be, uh, well, we'll find out, but those who selected D did really well. Um, so everything kind of starts at the beginning in microbiology. So a bug's life that we'll be talking about um, starts with specimen collection and transport, right? So spec uh, correct site is important, making sure that we minimize contamination. Collecting in the appropriate container is important. Um, whenever we can, we definitely want body fluids and tissues rather than uh, swabs, things like that. And when it comes to volume, that's also important. And so for blood cultures, the optimum is going to be three sets, usually, if we can, 20 mLs per set, collected from different sites over a 24-hour period. So we have lots of options for specimen collection and transport devices. Um, as I mentioned, swabs are very popular, right? We, we prefer tissues and fluids. Swabs are very popular mostly because they're convenient. Not particularly fabulous, though, just because they collect a small amount of specimen. The, uh, swab that we have here, which is the flocked swab, um, often referred to as the e-swab. If you have to use the swab, is perhaps the best swab, um, just because it does have a, a way of releasing the organisms that are captured in the swab, unlike the classic wound swab that we see with most transport devices. We also need to make sure that we also have adequate preservation of those specimens, right? And so for things like stool and urine, um, having preservatives is always very helpful. So once we've collected our specimens, we need to be able to see them, right? And our classic test is, of course, going to be the gram stain. If you remember everything in, in microbiology, it kind of goes in a big flow chart, right? And at the very top of the flow chart is gram stain. So heat or methanol fixation is going to be the way to go. I personally am a methanol fixer. Um, because I believe it, that it preserves the host cells and the bacteria better than heating. Um, when I, during my processing days, when I used to heat slides, I kind of cook them. And most of the time, it doesn't do a very good job for um, preserving your cellular morphology. Our primary stain is going to be crystal violet, right? This is the kind of violet blue stain. Gram-positive organisms, because of their thick cell wall, are going to be um, absorbing this stain. The Graham's iodine helps the crystal violet bind to the cell wall. Then, of course, we have a colorizer. I've kind of highlighted it here in different colors because it is really the only place that you can mess up a Graham stain, um, partly because the important thing with decolorizer, acetone alcohol is the thing to be using. Uh, equal, equal, you know, 50-50 mix, uh, too much acetone and you decolorize too quickly, too much alcohol and you decolorize too slowly. So that's really the only place you can, you can make a mistake. Um, any kind of timing, don't need to worry about that. So if you ever learn timing, you can forget it just for, you know, general, as a general rule. Um, so the decolorizer will remove um, fats and lipids from the cell and organisms like gram-negative organisms that have a very thin cell wall and a lot of lipid, the, the crystal violet will get wiped off with the decolorizer. And so then you need a counter stain. Most laboratories use saffronin as their counter stain. Um, you can all use, also use something like carbyl fusion. And so your gram negative organisms are basically going to pick up the counter stain, which will make them pink. So how do we interpret gram stains, right? So the first thing we should be looking at is, is the stain good? Did we do a good job of staining? So your host cells like neutrophils, hopefully no squamous cells there, but if there are, they should all be pink. 
So if, if your host cells are blue or purple, then you've under decolorized, right? You just haven't added enough to actually wash away the crystal violet. The next thing you're gonna be looking at is specimen quality. We're gonna evaluate that on low power, Definitely a must with respiratory specimens because specimens that have from the lower respiratory tract that have a lot of squamous cells um, are not acceptable for culture. Different labs have different methods for screening, but we do definitely need to have a screening protocol in place. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to evaluate our bacterial morphotypes on oil immersion. And the nice thing about that is that not only will it tell us if the gram stain is positive or not, but it will also give us a presumptive identification of the organisms that are likely causing infection. So here again on the left, you can see neutrophils are good, right? Squamous epithelial cells are bad. Um, you might say, well, why are they bad? And if you look at the inset on the bottom right of the slide, you can see why. Um, because all of the superficial bacteria, whether it be in a respiratory specimen or in a superficial uh, wound specimen, all of that bacteria that's associated with squamous cells will, of course, grow in culture, but doesn't mean anything clinically, right? And so we want to have lots of neutrophils and little or no squamous cells in all of our specimens. Other stains that we can use and that a lot of laboratories use include something like methylene blue to stain for um, neutrophils in stool specimens. Some labs also use gram stain. Um, you can use wasin stain. Um, it will pick up, it's very nice to pick up the bipolar staining of organisms like Ursinia pestis. Some laboratories use acridine orange. Um, this is primarily used in blood cultures um, when you have a positive blood culture with a negative gram stain. Acridine orange um, intercalates into the nucleic acid and fluoresces um, with UV light. And so you can see the basic shape and morphology of the organism. Uh, you just can't get a gram reaction, right? So you can see cocci or rods to let you know that there are organisms, in fact, in your gram state or in your positive blood culture. Um, you'll be learning more about this later today uh, where there's modified pinion stains to look for aerobic actinomycetes, such as nocardia. Uh, remember that the modified part um, is the difference in decolorizer between a regular acid fast stain and a modified acid fast stain, with the modified decolori decolorizer being 1% sulfuric acid instead of um, acid alcohol. Okay, so we've collected our specimen, we've done a, a gram stain on our specimen. Now we have to grow the organisms, right? And so just a quick review of media. Um, so we have our general purpose media, or kind of all purpose media, I call it. That's blood auger. It's usually 5% sheet blood auger. It's usually processed on, it's usually used to process most specimens. And it's capable of detecting most of our aerobic and facultatively anaerobic organisms. We also have more enriched media. Uh, the most common one that folks use is chocolate auger. Unfortunately, not made of chocolate. I wish it was, uh, but it does have, it, it, historically it was made by um, adding the blood to the auger when it was very hot and it basically ruptured the red cells, um, releasing the nutrients. Um, same principle now, we just do it a little, a little bit easier when we make the media. Um, but basically the point behind that is to allow fastidious organisms to grow because of those extra nutrients. So. Uh, organisms like Haemophilus, organisms like the pathogenic Neisseria, other organisms like that prefer to grow on enriched media. So we always add enriched media for lower respiratory tract specimens, for genital specimens, and for sterile body fluid specimens. We've also got selective media. Now we can make that media selective by um, adding something like a, a compound that inhibits one organism over another. Um, it could be something like an antibiotic as well. Um, so the example here is uh, xylose lysine desoxycholate auger and McConkey auger. These are some of our standard gram negative selective media that have additives that inhibit gram positive organisms, but allow gram negative organisms to grow. Now, some of that media you can also make differential. Now, the idea behind differential media is that when I look at the media based on the color reactions that I see, I can presumptively get an idea of what types of organisms are there, right? So the example here is hectone auger, which a lot of laboratories use um, for stool cultures. You wanna be able to pick out things that might be pathogenic like Salmonella and Shigella very quickly 
and be able to essentially ignore normal or resident flora like E. coli, Klebsiella, things like that. So if I see the plate on the left there with the kind of salmon colored colonies, I know that I don't have Salmonella or Shigella. Whereas if I look at the plate on the right here, um, there are some uh, black, yeah, they look like there are some black colonies on here. Um, so it might be Salmonella. So I, again, the addition of usually carbohydrates um, ena enables us to pick up uh, different patterns of carbohydrate usage. This is also the basis for all the chromogenic media that we use. Um, the chromogenic media has chromogenic substrates. Unfortunately, we don't get to know what they are. The companies don't tell us. Uh, but the idea being that particular organisms will produce particular colors. Um, there's lots of chromogenic media for lots of different organisms. Some laboratories use them for uh, detecting MRSA, some for uh, Enterococcus. We used to use it uh, for detecting Salmonella. Um, pretty much lots of different organisms. And the nice thing is that you can just look at the plate and know immediately what the organism is. Now, blood auger, even though it's not selective, can be differential. And when we talk about the streps today, uh, we'll talk about the ability to detect different groups of strep based on their hemolytic patterns. Again, whether they're uh, non-hemolytic, alpha hemolytic, showing that greening of the auger, or completely hemolytic or showing beta hemolysis, we can again group organisms into specific groups for the strep. We've also got specialized media, some that we use for things like susceptibility testing, which we'll talk about tomorrow, like Mueller Hinton Auger. We've got specialized media that we use for anaerobic culture. And then we've got specialized media for particular pathogens like buffered charcoal yeast extract for Legionella and Reagan Low media for Bordentella. And of course, growth conditions are important, right? We know that we have aerobic organisms versus anaerobic organisms. So aerobic organisms basically can utilize glucose in the presence of oxygen. Anaerobic organisms cannot grow in the presence of oxygen. And we've also got some organisms that are kind of somewhere in between, right? We know that things like E. coli and Staph aureus, they grow perfectly fine in the, uh, the presence of oxygen, but also have the ability to grow in without oxygen as well, right? And so that's what makes them facultative. Um, we've also got microaerophilic organisms. These are things like Campylobacter and Helicobacter. Uh, they like very small amounts of oxygen, um, some carbon dioxide and nitrogen. So that's the microaerophilic atmosphere. And then lots of especially fastidious organisms like Haemophilus and the pathogenic Neisseria like catenophilic conditions, and that's just an increase in carbon dioxide above ambient air. And so most microbiology laboratories will have both an ambient air incubator and a carbon dioxide incubator to facilitate growth of all of those organisms. Okay, next question. Uh, which of the following tests is currently recommended for the diagnosis of helicobacter? Is it uh, stool culture? Is it helicobacter antibody? Is it stool antigen? or is it the radio-labeled carbon breath test? Actually, I'm just gonna bring up the chat and then minimize it. Okay. All right, so I've got a bunch of different answers if I'm getting the same ones here, right? Um, so let's, we'll talk about that in just a sec. And so let's talk about some non-culture methods really quickly. Right, so we know that culture is great. Culture is very sensitive. Sometimes not very fast, though. So, so sometimes we, we and a little bit harder for some organisms than others. So we do have both antigen detection and nucleic acid amplification methods that help us with detecting organisms. So let's start with antigen detection. Uh, we have fluorescent antibody tests available for detecting uh, things like Legionella, Bordetella, and Chlamydia in direct specimens. Um, what we have here is the inclusions of chlamydia trachomatis that we'll talk about a little bit later, um, use, detected using a fluorescent monoclonal antibody against chlamydia trachomatis. And here we have a Legionella direct fluorescent antibody test done on a bronchoalveolar lavage fluid. We've also got both microplate and immunochromatographic um, enzyme immunoassays that are available uh, for picking up organisms such as Legionella and Streptococcus pneumoniae.